Hello, I'm Chris. And I'm Cherie. You might know us online at rvmobileinternet.com. And technomadia.com. So we have been on the road for over a decade now, traveling and working all over the country, uh, full-time RVing, and connectivity is important to us. We work remotely. We're app developers, software developers, tech advisors. We've done some writing, and you've probably seen some of our YouTube videos. Some of it for fun, some of it for work, but connectivity is an essential amenity for us on the road. So over the years, so many people have asked us for tips and tricks for how to stay connected, how do we do it, how do we work, how do we socialize online, that we just started pulling all this information together and well, eventually it grew into a book. <laughs> this is the fourth edition. We just issued this one in uh, late February of 2016. It's freshly updated. Each year it gets better and better, more in depth as we learn more about how to present this information and, and as it evolves. It evolves. It gets easier to read, simpler, and everything else. And then we have a really great online resource center at rvmobileinternet.com that keeps track of all the things that change because this stuff is changing all the time. So we're tracking the news over there. So any new deals that come up, new developments, or things that you need to be aware of, we track over there. And you can subscribe to that email list uh, by RSS. And um, we also have a premium membership group where we yeah. take it further with our members. But this video, we want to give you an overview of the typical options that RVers use to keep connected. So the ways that RVers get online is the, the number one way is cellular. Cellular data and cellular internet has gotten to be really, really good. And then there's Wi-Fi, the free source that a lot of people really hope will work on <laughs> yes. the road. We're going to tell you a little bit about the, the pros and cons of that. The downsides and the gears you can use. And then there's the pie in the sky, the reach for the stars, <laughs> almost a fantasy, but not quite, it's actually real, uh, option of satellite internet. So we'll tell you all the latest <laughs> and greatest there. So we're gonna go through the pros and cons for you and teach you a little bit, maybe give you some information that'll help you on your journey to researching these. So if you go on to any RVing group or forum, you're gonna see the question asked almost daily, what is the best way to keep connected? And there is no best way. There is no universal one right answer for everyone because everyone's needs are different. Some people are just out exploring. They're retired or taking a gap year or even in vacation mode. And they just need internet to check their email, maybe scope out what their next destination is going to be or what cool things there are to do. And others, others are working, <laughs> working nine to five and or homeschooling. They might have video calls. They might need to have absolutely reliable connectivity wherever they go. And those needs are gonna be very different. And also their travel style. If you're gonna be in national parks, out in the boonies, in rural areas where there's not as many options, then your decisions on what equipment and plans you need on board can be very different than if you're just going from park to park to park in major cities. Yeah. So it is all, we consider it all about building your personal connectivity arsenal. How many options do you want to have on board? It's kind of like a golfer assembling their bag of putters and clubs. <laughs> yes. So you wouldn't show up at the Masters with just a single putter in your, in your um, golf bag. But, you know, going mini golfing, well, you're all set. So, so it, it, the part you have to understand is that you need to think through what your needs really are. How much is need? How much is luxury? And how many reserve parachutes do you want before you jump out of the airplane? And just how critical it is and how many options you're willing to carry on board, how much installation you want to go through, how much upfront equipment you want to purchase, and how many plans you want to have ready to go when you need them. Because sometimes you get to a location and your plan A has no signal. Plan B is overly congested. Plan C, you might have already gone over your data limit for the month. And uh, oh, Plan D, you might have accidentally run over while backing your <laughs> RV up. <laughs> All these things can happen on the road. And it's not easy to secure a Plan E um, if you don't have it already in board. Sometimes, you know, Amazon, it takes at least a day to get to yes. you. <laughs> so building a smart arsenal is key and it will be different for everyone. So We've... some people might have multiple cellular options. They might integrate in Wi-Fi. They might integrate in antennas and boosters. What's right for you is going to be very different from what's not, what's right for the next person. We've now done over a hundred personal advising sessions with people, helping them determine what their needs are and what the right equipment and plans are for them. And, and I can say everybody's is different. No two have been the same.
So we're going to give you some information here up next on the major options, so hopefully it'll give you a place to start with your research. So cellular is probably the most common and the easiest way to get online. And but you probably already have a cellular option in your pocket that you use almost daily. And but, that's any uh, cell phone device. So pretty much every smartphone can create what's known as a personal hotspot, where you can go into the settings and turn on hotspot mode. It creates a Wi-Fi connection that all your other devices can get on and share, but they're sharing in the limited data on your cell phone plan. And that can get expensive very quickly. So you do need to be careful about that. And you also need to shop your plans carefully to make sure that it includes that feature. Now, all of the carriers, most of their plans do include it, especially if you're paying by the gigabyte. Um, a lot of the unlimited plans still have a lot of uh, limits. caveats and limits on it that are out sharing. there. Yes. And then some of the third party ones, like if you're purchasing through Straight Talk or other uh, NVNOs, they don't include mobile hotspot use. So you do need to be very aware when you're shopping for a cell phone plan if you want that feature. Now, one downside of using your cell phone to create a mobile internet connection for your other devices is, well, what if one person goes, runs off to the store and they got the internet in their pocket? Then everyone else is offline. It's great for a solo travel. It's great for someone who just has moderate needs. It's great for your secondary carrier. But for a primary carrier, if you have a lot of data needs in your household, having a dedicated cellular device that's only purpose is to provide a data is probably going to be your best solution. So these are what is known as a mobile hotspots, also um, sometimes called MiFi's or Jetpacks. Which are just marketing names. They're yeah. all the same thing. So these are small little routers that take a cellular signal and make a Wi-Fi hotspot out of it. And usually this, the Wi-Fi signal that these can transmit is large enough for most RVs to be covered by. So they're a great solution. They have a battery built into them so you can take these with you on a hike, if you go into town or something like that. So they are very mobile and they can usually last about 10 hours or so and they're a great solution um, they can usually be purchased for under two hundred dollars from the carriers or on eBay or Amazon some of them actually have external antenna ports which open up your options to getting a better connection from the roof and there are solutions for all four of the major carriers for these hotspot plans if you have a tiered data plan with one of the carriers you can usually just add this on for ten or twenty dollars to your plan to share that data or you might be able to find data only plans out there that can serve your needs with these devices as well now, then there are other options. There are actually routers that have integrated um, cellular modems into them. So if you have one something built into your RV that's not portable, not battery powered, you can actually get um, um, routers that have the cellular radios built right directly into them. And these will be stronger. They're going to give you a stronger Wi-Fi signal. They might have antennas built in to get a better cellular signal. They might have other features built in and other routers they might have ports built in if you want to do, uh, there's some with Ethernet ports if you want to do a wired network within your RV, such as as the Wi-Fi Ranger, um, it's got ports on it, but it requires tethering in an outside yeah. source, and some have integrated in once you just put the SIM card into the router. So there's all sorts of solutions out there, combine. <laughs> ranging from very inexpensive to maybe around $100, to solutions that go up into the thousands that are more enterprise or commercial solutions. All right. Now, which carrier should you go with? That's always a hot topic, and most everyone's going to tell you right off the bat, Verizon. Verizon is indeed the number one carrier in the U.S. for a reason. They have a big network. They've invested a lot in it, but there are other carriers to consider. So there and are they're not always the best in all places. That's right. the thing about the carriers. It each has specialty places where they have the strongest signal, and if you're traveling all about, you may not necessarily be closest to where their tower is, or you may get there and you have a whole bunch of RVers with Verizon yep. and they're all surfing or streaming <laughs> and you can't get much it, going. It isn't always <laughs> just about signal. Sometimes congestion really matters and if one tower is full and overloaded, having that ripcord to pull an emergency parachute switch from Verizon to AT&T, <laughs> Verizon to T-Mobile, and suddenly you're back online while all your Verizon friends are uh, struggling. Now we have a separate video just on the four carriers that you can go and review. We have an article on it at RV Mobile internet.com slash four slash slash carriers where you can go and get a lot more information that's current on them. Um, AT&T we generally consider the second best option. T-Mobile is a really intriguing option right now. They have all of their plans with six gigabytes or more of data include unlimited video streaming on YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, HBO, and Now, and a whole Stars, bunch of other yeah. solutions. Um, and they have mobile without borders which allows you to use your plan in Canada and Mexico as if you were in the U.S. 
and also have unlimited data around the world at slower speeds. So, Some really cool options with T-Mobile. So all these carriers and all these plans are always changing. This is a very, very dynamic topic. So check in with us online to see what the latest is. Now, all four of the carriers do currently have unlimited data options. Really, even Verizon, it can be done at the moment. <laughs> um, some of them are grandfathered in plans, like the Verizon plans, and we do have a full guide to that in our member section that's constantly tracking how to go about getting those. Um, AT&T has one that's only available to their direct TV customers and does not include any tethering at current time. T-Mobile has one that includes 14 gigabytes of tethering and Sprint has one as well that includes three gigabytes of, of tethering. But they all have some other caveats, so you really need to go and investigate what they are before you sign up and understand what they include. But getting an unlimited plan, particularly a Verizon unlimited plan that you could stream all you want and you don't have to worry about data caps is actually one of the nicest things uh, you can do in an RV. Gotta say. <laughs> well, I think plumbing's pretty cool too. Plumbing is good, but internet is <laughs> up there. Cellular boosting. So one of the things about cellular is your signal quality is going to change depend upon where you're parked, how close you are to the tower, what obstacles there might be in between you and the tower, and the construction of your RV. Now, if you're living inside a, a metal tube like Airstreamers or bus conversion people, your signal is being blocked in all directions and you need to have some way to get that signal up and out and onto the roof. So the simplest solution is just an antenna that goes up on your roof. This is a very simple one. We have very complex complex ones as well, and then they need something to plug into. So some mobile hotspot devices have antenna ports built into them, some don't. Most cell phones don't. So a direct antenna solution is not always viable for all devices. But if you don't have an antenna port, and or even if you do, one way to get a better signal inside is to use what is known as a cellular booster. This takes a signal from the antenna up on the roof runs it through an amplifier and then rebroadcasts it from a signal from an antenna inside your RV so things near very near that interior antenna get a much much stronger signal so this is a great solution these can usually you can find them online between three and four five hundred dollars there's several models out there we recommend most RVers go with a mobile approved version um, mainly because they are made for the smaller spaces of an RV there are household ones out there they can be made to work in some RV situations especially larger ones but you need to know a lot about antenna separation oscillation yeah. and other struggles with boosters yeah, so boosters can be a bit complicated the simplest way to go is actually with a cradle style booster like this this so, will actually hold a hotspot or your phone just sits in the cradle so a single thing can connect at once and then this goes to an antenna on the roof and it's simple it's not nearly as powerful of a booster but it's cheaper and easier and is a good way to get started for people who are just exploring a little want a little bit of extra boost now for the current options of boosters go to rvmobileinternet.com slash boosters and we have a comparative guide there to all the current mobile boosters that we're tracking their prices and comparisons of their specs for our members we also have some more in-depth reviews hands-on and, testing and hand, we've tested these across the country head to head so we know which ones work best in each location wi-fi it's free in a lot of places that's the good part everybody fantasizes about unlimited free wi-fi out on the road pulling into campgrounds out of the big sign free Wi-Fi and they're going to get down there and stream their Netflix. A lot of other places also offer Wi-Fi. Cafes, breweries, stores, airports, hotels. You can find Wi-Fi hotspots all over the place and a lot of people fantasize about being able to pull their RV into a parking lot and use the Wi-Fi at McDonald's as much as they want. And it is possible, but it has some caveats. So the, the catch is, Cellular has gotten vastly faster over the years, whereas Wi-Fi really has not improved in neither speed nor distance much at all. And But the demands for, for data have gone through the roof. So a lot of RV Park Wi-Fi networks aren't even close to being up to the demands that put on them. So look at it this way. Let's say that an RV Park was trying to set up their water system at their sites, and all they had was a garden hose coming into the entire park, and they're expecting that garden hose to be able to fill up 70 RVs and provide all the water pressure they need. Now I know some RV parks are kind of like that. <laughs> um, but that's a lot of how they approach internet for their patrons, is they bring in a small bit of 
of internet a lot what we call backhaul into the RV park and then distribute it they might even invest a lot in good Wi-Fi repeating equipment throughout the RV park but there's just not enough bandwidth to go around for everybody so before you get invest a lot of money in long-range Wi-Fi gear here's the first simple test to do if the RV parks that matter to you take a laptop up and walk up to the front office and see how good is the connection when you're sitting right there, right in the front office, right up in the, the rec room, wherever they have the hotspot. If it's good there, if it's fast enough to do the things you want, investing in better gear in your RV can help you bring that signal across the RV park and into your RV, or across the parking lot from McDonald's and into your RV. But make sure it's worth doing that first. Now, an RV park, when they're putting together their Wi-Fi network, they are intentionally usually trying to distribute the signal out to the RV spots. Keep in mind that a public Wi-Fi source, like at a restaurant or library or other place, is they've built their Wi-Fi networks to aim Keep the signal inside. to inside for their customers, not to serve those trying to get the Wi-Fi signal out in the parking lot. They want customers. This is a service for their customers. Right. And more than likely, you're going to get your best signal and surfing experience if you go into the restaurant, buy that latte, buy some french fries, support the business, and do your surfing there within their restaurant. Because a lot of it, a lot of Wi-Fi source, it's not just on the gear you have to receive it. It's the gear that the provider is using to transmit it. And they might be using omnidirectional gear or very directional gear just to serve their intended area. Now, the important thing to remember is Wi-Fi was always intended to be a short range connection. So you might hear people talk about getting a signal over one mile or five miles or even crazy further. They're doing that with specialized gear on both ends of the connection or they're getting a really, really slow, barely usable signal. If you want to have a good Wi-Fi experience, don't really count on it at long, long range. But you can do it over the range of a typical RV park. Now, what are the options? Let's say you do find some Wi-Fi that's worthwhile repeating. The most simplest are little Wi-Fi gizmos. These are going to have a stronger radio and antenna than what your laptop or your tablet might have built in. You can put this in a window. Keep in mind, line of sight is the most important thing, is being able to physically see the Wi-Fi hotspot that you're trying to connect to. If you get one of these ones that plugs into an outlet that might be like below your, uh, your windows, mm -hmm. it's not going to be able to see a Wi-Fi hotspot 500 yards away at the bathhouse. Yes. So there's other things like this. This is a little um, uh, device that would go in your window and either plug directly into your computer via the USB port or into an interior router that will rebroadcast and create a new Wi-Fi network as well. So these are some pretty affordable options. They're small, simple things. They're not going to work miracles, but they are usually better than your laptops and tablets these are, alone. These are going to be priced in about the $100 range. They're a great first option if you just think that Wi-Fi is going to be an occasional one. This particular one, the Pepway, it also can take a cellular input. It's got a USB input jack. So if you have a jetpack or a USB modem, you can also use this to rebroadcast cast your cellular solution as well as Wi-Fi. So it's kind of really handy little gizmo. Now taking things to the next level means literally taking to the next level and putting the Wi-Fi gear up on the roof. So um, a professional directional, a professional uh, omnidirectional CPE like this, this is actually some of the same hardware that the RV parks might be installing mounted on your RV roof. In this case from Wi-Fi Ranger with a very simple RV or friendly interface. You put something like this up on your roof, mount it to a ladder, mount it to a bat wing so it can fly lie flat and then it pairs with an interior Wi-Fi Ranger router. So you've got super strong Wi-Fi up on the roof where there's the best possible line of sight and then you've got an interior network that's completely separate. This is kind of the gold standard is having a CPE on the roof to do longer range Wi-Fi. And then of course if you go with the interior router some of them can support cellular inputs as well so you're getting the best of both worlds with them. Um, good solutions. These are going to be much more pricier. You're looking for a setup like this around $600 to have both components and you really have to question how often are you going to be able to utilize it and will it be worth that expense will, for you? Will the Wi-Fi actually be that much better and cheaper in the long run than cellular? Every every case is different. We find the Wi-Fi most valuable actually is when driveway surfing with friends. Yes, when we can go in and access their private Wi-Fi network, which may have a high bandwidth cable or DSL connection that's not being spread out to 200 of our neighbors. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's the that that's the ups and downs of Wi-Fi. In a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> or or maybe in a geosynchronous <laughs> orbit, um, uh, 23,000 miles over the equator. Where are in satellite internet options available? And 
It's exciting. The idea of being able to connect from anywhere in the country just by aiming a dish up to the southern sky is undeniably gets a lot of our viewers really worked up. Now this was the way that our viewers primarily got online before cellular got so prevalent and so much more useful. HughesNet, Motosat, those are words you might have hear, heard around the campfire at most campgrounds. <laughs> but the, the catch with satellite is you're talking to something that is 23,000 miles away as opposed to a cell tower that is maybe 10. And it is a hard thing to do. And then there is speed of light comes into play. There is that round trip time. Catch with satellite is it can be done. It's expensive and has gotten more expensive. Um, and it usually if there is cellular available, cellular will be cheaper and faster and easier. But there are places, there are still plenty of places where there is no other options and satellite suddenly becomes the thing that makes the most sense. And there are currently two options that are available to us mobile users. Those of us that want to be able to move about the country. One comes on a tripod, one is a dish that gets mounted on the roof of your RV. Expect costs to range between a thousand and six thousand dollars to get either of those options installed and then your data plans are going to be pretty pricey but for those of those who understand what they're getting into and understand the trade-offs satellite can indeed be the only option in the places that you want to go now you're going to see satellite advertised all over the place as having a satellite internet option you're going to see like dish and, and um, direct tv advertising an internet option that you can add on to your television plan Television and internet are two very different satellite technologies. Television is mainly just receiving a signal down from the satellite. Internet requires a two-way connection for going up, and they are different equipment. You cannot get both on the same dish directly. And the when you see Dish and Directv offer these uh, solutions, what they're really doing is they're partnering with local providers, whether it's cable, DSL, or a home-based satellite solution, and combining your build together. They're not actually turning on an internet connection on your DISH yeah. network. The, the, the limitation of all these home-based satellite internet connections, which have gotten pretty decent in the last few years, is that they use a technology called spot beam, where instead of a single satellite beam covering the entire country, which enables you to travel in Rome, there's a small beam that might only be 50 to 100 miles across, and you are subscribed to that particular beam. And if you leave that beam, you no longer have service. So people get excited about taking their their dish in, dish net on the road or some of these other spot beam services. And until the technology evolves, it actually will not work at all. There are technical limitations that prevent that. And there are some exciting things on the horizon for satellite. We are keeping an eye on them, but nothing else. Several up. years away. Several years away. So, there you go, satellite. Now, of course, those aren't the only options for internet on the road. If you get creative, and or depending on your circumstances, actually there are quite a few others. There's RV parks that do have cable run right to the sites where you might be able to su subscribe to uh, a cable internet service and have high speed unlimited bandwidth at your campsite. Yep. Some regional areas have wireless ISPs that you might be able to subscribe to if you're in a place for a long enough time as well. And if you're, your uh, needs are very low bandwidth, uh, ham radio for non-commercial use might be an option for you. Or there's also like just basically satellite pagers. If you're only sending very, very small messages, well, you can get some affordable satellite plans that let you send things the length of a tweet. There's also finding co-working spaces as you travel in cities that offer basically a rent-a-desk sort of situation. Wait. And when you're renting a desk, you're usually renting very fast internet to go along <laughs> So there's it. lots of options out there. But that's kind of a wrap-up of the solutions out there. Obviously, we can't go into the depth that we can in a book and a video of this length and not burn through all of your internet. <laughs> <laughs> but come visit us at rvmobileinternet.com. There is a ton more information to be had there. Um, this overview, um, the technology is changing all the time. We could get this uploaded to YouTube and there could be a major change <laughs> that has changed something that we just talked about. Uh, if you go to rvmobileinternet.com slash overview, which is where this video will be embedded at, we do keep the text of this article updated as things change in the industry. So you can always get the newest options there. We keep some of the most popular plans for cellular listed there and links to more information that we offer over on the Resource Center. Well, thank you for joining us. See you online.